Hi, everybody. This is the SMC Journal podcast. This is a show that's all about software engineering in IT today. And we talk about DevOps, performance testing, tuning, uh, security, you name it. Uh, we're on it. If you're dealing with it and enterprise level software, we're probably talking about it today. Uh, I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thank you for being with me today. You notice that my agent 503 has changed to a Ramon. He is officially Joey Maron, uh, Joey Maron, jo- <laughs> Joey Ramon from the Ramones. If you've seen our latest parody out there, um, I want to talk about a couple of things today that are pretty exciting. Uh, Loadrunner has released a brand new release in 2023. It's the first release post the open text acquisition that we've seen. And so we want to talk about that today. You know, Microfocus is actually one of the major sponsors of this program. They're the makers of Loadrunner Professional Enterprise Cloud and Developer. And if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to the Loadrunner family page where you can find out more about Loader and how you can download the free community edition so you can check it out, and try it. Uh, 50 virtual users for most of the protocols, I believe. And um, even though it's a now an open text product, it's the same product that we know and love. But there are changes coming, and that's what the topic of today's show is about. So in order to find out about all the new features and updates for the 2023 version of LoadRunner, uh, we're going to bring on one of the product marketing managers, David McLeish. Let's talk to him now and find out directly from him what's going on with LoadRunner. Hey, David, you're back on the SMC Journal podcast. Welcome. Hey, Scott. Good to be back as always. Hey, I'm excited. We've got a new version of Loadrunner coming out, and uh, there's lots to talk about. So I wanted to give you uh, plenty of time <laughs> where you can talk about what's what's the latest. Tell us. Yeah, and it's it's a major release. So this is obviously our first one of the year. Uh, and with the major, we always try and have a couple of sort of big ticket items. We want some real good bells and whistles. Uh, and this release is, is no different. We're still doing lots of the customer driven innovation that we're doing. So we're taking our ideas and feedback from our community and we're doing those, but we're also moving with with lots of market trends as well, such as chaos and resiliency, uh, data and analytics. So any APM vendors out there, we're, we're trying to make sure we're catching up with all of those. And then usually underpinning that, we have our core infrastructure updates, uh, security and infrastructure updates. And then obviously it goes without saying that uh, we need to make sure that the view gen gets updated. We have new protocol support. Uh, we're also doing lots of updates to loads on our developer in terms of supporting the dev web protocol and also lots of customer driven enhancements for, for LRD. So there's been quite a lot I have to say put into this. And uh, I think our customers are going to be very happy with, with this release and, and also the things we sort of have planned for, for the release. Uh, releases yet later in the year, which will sort of be started now and underpinned by all of all of the work we we have the foundations for now. Let's drill into some of the the major new things that we can expect. Let's start with Loadrunner Professional. So, what's the biggest mm-hmm. things that we can look forward to seeing? The way we're categorizing things now is we're sort of working on standardized features that we're going to put out right across the family. So, some of these will be like user experience. Some of these will be modernization stories. And in terms of the user experience, what we're sort of going to see here is we're bringing out uh, a new flexible consumption model uh, across Load Owner Professional and Load Owner Enterprise. So historical customers of ours will remember the old virtual user days or FUDs as they were effectively known, uh, but they were discontinued probably two to three years back. Uh, and we lost a little bit of the flexibility that we had when customers just wanted uh, a license that they could consume over a set period of time and not be tied to uh, longer subscriptions or fixed quantities. So we're bringing out uh, the FUDs again, but they're they're going to be known as virtual user flex days. Uh, and agree, and this is one that we're really happy with because we've had lots of customer demand for these, uh, our own internal sales reps have been getting lots of, of interest now that, that they're starting to understand that these will be available with the release. Uh, and also, we were getting some some press, the fact that maybe some of our uh, licensing and consumption was a little bit old and stale, but now we have this new 
flexible model. Uh, we're really excited. This is one that's going to generate lots of interest. And on the back of those, we then have lots of plans about how we get better reporting and better statistics around use and deployment. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that is one of the big ones that uh, we're pretty happy with across the family. What about mm-hmm. protocols? Are there any new protocols or enhancements to existing protocols? DevWeb has got quite a lot of, of work uh, on that, primarily because that's the protocol uh, within LoadRunner Developer. So there's lots of things that we're doing to make sure that ViewGen is catching up with all of the stuff that we really did for for uh, for LRD. Uh, we've also expanded some of our support uh, for Citrix. So Citrix is a big one, and we had, I wouldn't say a few gaps, but there's a few things that we, we, we needed to, to catch up on. So we've put, I think, three or four new APIs there. Uh, again, and this was things where, where customers were coming to us with some of these concerns that maybe they weren't able to capture a window that was in the background, it wasn't in the foreground, or they needed to more accurately track windows by size and dimension, things like that. Uh, So we've expanded our Citrix API. Uh, We've also expanded some of our features that we released with .NET Plus. Uh, We've added support for for Citrix Azure uh, as well. Uh, And and as you know, I mean, our protocol strength uh, and the breadth of our technology stack that's one of the big selling points of LoadRunner. It's probably unmatched in the industry. I mean, I know of, of multiple protocols that we're already looking to bring as new ones. Uh, and probably some of these will, will fall under the normal protocol licenses that customers have. So they'll be able to consume those for free. Uh, so yeah, really, really good progress this and also uh, setting a foundation for, for the releases later this year. Uh, how how popular still is Citrix in terms of uh, API usage? So is it still pretty popular? It, it is. It's, it's, I mean, it's one of our most popular protocols uh, after the standard web uh, and true client. It, it's still up there. Uh, and also a lot of our customers that come in from our heritage microfocus side of the house, uh, from the Silk side, I mean, uh, Silk Performer, had superb uh, Citrix support. So a lot of those customers we have converted over to the LoadRunner family. And I mean, there's probably not a day or two that goes past that I don't see something come across my desk around Citrix. If you look at our forums, it's one of those things that uh, customers are still having some challenges testing because it is a a pretty complex uh, protocol to support. And in fact, I have seen multiple requests for us to support Citrix moving to a cloud-based access uh, rather than going through the old sort of tech client or RDP connection. Uh, So yeah, it's definitely one that I'm seeing that it is heavily used and it's something we'll continue to, to focus on and probably even start beefing up our uh, documentation and maybe even do self-paced tutorials on this because it, it, it's time consuming when things come in and people have to start from scratch. So we're wanting to, to sort of go with our messes that we're increasing our user experience for customers. So we're going to start hopefully beefing up the documentation. Uh, but yeah, definitely one that we see day in, day out. It's still being heavily used. Okay. What about True Client? We've got any updates there? Yeah, so True Client, uh, we've updated our uh, Chromium engine to 108 uh, in this release. Uh, and like every release that we do, uh, we would love to support the, the one that has just dropped, but there's a bit of time and effort that goes in because we have to embed that engine into True Client. Uh, and I know it's one that customers are always asking us to, to, to do more on, but when we take that, I mean, we have to take that entire engine. Uh, take some things out, put some of our own things in there so that we have all of the hooking mechanisms and control. Uh, And it is time consuming, but it's one that we have a continual investment. Every release we make, we will update our our engines to to the latest and greatest. Uh, And again, it's one of those, there is some concerns around the memory and the footprint uh, that we have for those, but all vendors face that same challenge. Uh, And it's because... If you look at Chromium now or look at any browser engine now, they are getting bigger. Even if you're just using it standalone on a desktop, you look at that executable and the the memory that consumes. 
Uh, every window takes more and more memory. And if you think that we're then having to interact with that, capture all of those commands that's going through, build up a visual tree and true client. So there is, it is, it is a challenge that we are aware of. Uh, every vendor out there faces that. And we have long-term goals throughout this year about how we're going to do that. We have ideas around reducing that footprint and even swapping things in and out. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it is a concern. But the idea is that although you need sort of load generators, uh, lots of them, if you wanted to run an entire test, only using browser-driven load testing, but that's usually not the idea. This is to capture the end user experience and those metrics that you want to see the end user uh, that, that they're experiencing. And then you would then couple that with a, a normal transport layer script, and that then generates the load and the capacity. And the idea is then you have the results there, and you have the full picture end-to-end -end from end user, plus all of the stuff that's happening at, at all of the different layers. But, but it is a challenge, and it's one... Every release we do this year, you will definitely see we will up, be updating the, those uh, those engines. Yeah, I think it's really important for people to understand because I've I've joked about the size of the footprint of a true client <laughs> virtual user and how you have to have all this generator power, uh, supercomputer power to make it happen. Uh, because some people, some people just because it's so easy to record in true client versus a web mm -hmm. protocol uh, with all the correlation, yeah. they just they get the <sighs> script done easier. They don't want to do the regular transport. They just want it all to be in uh, yeah. true client and just push it. We'll get more machines. But people need yeah. to realize that any support for any browser, you have to, if you're supporting that browser, you're, mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're inheriting the size of the footprint of that browser. And so Chromium yeah. is one of those ones where if, if Chromium core gets updated and it gets larger, well, the footprint of true client is going to get larger because you're inheriting that. And yeah. same for any browser, it's the browser that's changing, not necessarily uh, anything in load runner and any vendor who is supporting a browser based approach to uh, recording and playback is going to face the same problem. If they support that browser version, they're going to inherit those that bloat, if you will, from, from a browser. So I wanted to make sure people, people got that. Um, what about yeah. anything else on the surrounding load runner professional <coughs> in the analysis or any other peripheral things that are going on? Any other updates? Yeah. So, so there, there's a few other things as well. Obviously, uh, we are looking to modernize our entire uh, controller uh, infrastructure. So some people who's been using the controller on LRP, they will see some of our UIs were a little bit maybe maybe dated on that. So we've swapped in a new technology there. Uh, and in fact, one of these is where we now output the, uh, the errors and logs. We have a brand new output technology there. And with that output technology, we got to get lots of capabilities around better uh, sorting and grouping, better export, better reporting. And actually, one of the byproducts of this is that we found when we swapped that technology out, we got better stability uh, on the controller uh, because of the old technology was draining resources. So now we have increased the stabilization of the controller again, which goes a long way to increasing user confidence uh, and also probably adding on to what we did last time around uh, or a couple of releases back where we could actually load balance uh, those users across different LGs. So I think all of this is adding up to a, to a much richer uh, user experience. Uh, that's just one. We've also did things like uh, we've updated some of our APM support. Uh, now this time around, we didn't take a brand new vendor on, uh, although we have a couple on the list. Uh, but Prometheus has come in uh, from a, with a couple of requests that we only supported the standard HTTP. So we had to then uh, add in HTTPS support for Prometheus. We've added some other additional things for Prometheus where you could sort of uh, predefine all the measurements rather than having to add them individually. Uh, let me see. We also, yeah, another good one is uh, network virtualization. Uh, so that report there, again, was pretty stale and old and was only accessible in one place. So now we've actually built a new web UI to consume that, that output report. Uh, and it looks really neat and fancy and just refreshes our whole offering. Uh, and bear in mind, Network virtualization, it's one of those things uh, that sometimes get, gets forgot about, uh, that it's available in Loadrunner. And I mean, it's a definite 
competitive advantage because not a, a lot of other vendors do that. It's a bit like service virtualization. People forget we have that. Uh, so now the NV Insights report is now available. Uh, it can be easily shared and exported and used in other stakeholder meetings. But more importantly, it's also available in the analysis engine. So now you can then uh, get an access to that uh, in in sort of tandem with the other normal measurements that you're collecting as part of a, a run. So again, it's about trying to satisfy that area that's that's very time consuming uh, on, a, on, a, on a performance tester. And we know for a fact that the two parts to this, it's usually scripting and recording and post-test analysis. So again, this is one of our investment areas for this year where we're trying to make sure we, we satisfy both both ends of that spectrum. Well, you know, you, you mentioned network virtualization. What, what really gets me is it's been in there for a long time and companies are now experienced, especially on a retail side, 70% of their transactions are through mobile devices. They're through cellular connections. They're not on <laughs> desktops on a pristine, you know, LAN environment, but yet yeah. performance testers are not using network virtualization to simulate that network why you have this capability and it gives you a totally different picture of what the end user is really experiencing uh, under load. So I, I don't understand why yeah. more people aren't using that. But. And and, me, and I mean, it's, it should be one of the value propositions that, that we ourselves should be probably telling a better story because I feel that it is buried in there and it always doesn't come out to the fore because people think about true client. Uh, they think about our protocol support. But that sometimes gets missed. And, and then today, we know that people are not co-located in one office. They know their consumers aren't just located in one state, town, or even uh, geography. So having the ability to build these network profiles that can simulate end user experience from across the globe. And I mean, it's just as easy as setting up a profile and assigning different uh, download and upload speeds from that. And you can test the whole gamut, right, from somebody on a, almost a, a wired modem to something more 4 or 5G related. Uh, and again, it's definitely a feature that that I think we probably, as OpenTax, need to do better to tell that story. And it's one that I'm trying to talk to customers about and show the sort of the value that that can bring. Oh. So what about um, how all of this affects the other versions of LoadRunner? So LoadRunner Enterprise uh, and LoadRunner Cloud, um, are there, uh, obviously they will inherit a lot of the, the upgrade updates as well, but are there specific mm -hmm. things that you're updating in those releases? Yeah, so uh, again, for, for Enterprise, I mean, we're looking at the same sort of uh, standardized features that we're bringing out. So we want to increase user experience we want to make sure people have the best data and analytics to make decisions on. Uh, and in fact, some of the good stuff that we were bringing out in LRP last release and even the release before, LoadRunner Enterprise has caught up and consumed all of that. So they're catching up on all of the APM monitors. So Prometheus is in there. They've also inherited the Prometheus HTTPS support. Uh, we've also, LoadRunner Enterprise now supports our sub-performer customers because we can run the scripts natively, uh, but some of those customers weren't able to see all of the results visualized in the nice uh, Load Runner Enterprise, uh, Enterprise dashboards. They're now, now available. Uh, it's also consuming the, the new flexible licenses that we're bringing up. And then a lot of things just around admin and tenancy and being able to, to give better control of that. Things like being able to copy projects and templates and reports. Uh, let me see. There's been a lot of work done on integrations uh, around Kubernetes. Um, there's REST API updates, new features to list all the users and then all of the, the API commands to, to query that user. And again, they've also uh, things like security and infrastructure. And I know it's one that the customers uh, have always complained about, for example, the needing to disable UAC or DEP. So we have a lot of work that went into that while still maintaining the, the security policies uh, at the end user company, but also sort of getting a balance right where a customer doesn't need to be a super administrator to be able to install LoadRunner Enterprise or some of those components. Uh, so yeah, a lot of work done on that uh, and also 
LoadRunner Cloud, they, they have a ton of new uh, features put in as well. Uh, things such as new, uh, new farms in different regions. They've added, uh, they've added, what else? Let me see, AWS CloudWatch. Uh, so we had lots of customers wanting that. So across the family, they're the only uh, group that's actually taken on a new APM vendor. And it probably fits better with the, the cloud story that CloudWatch uh, was the nerd. I mean, there was requests from enterprise customers and professional customers for CloudWatch, but it made more sense for this release to invest the time and effort on the LRC team. So they've did that. Uh, and also, uh, importantly, there's been lots of dashboard updates because uh, the reporting of the LRC is really good. And that's not even mentioning LRD. I mean, that's now a standalone product, uh, which obviously is being used. It's, it's actually starting to, it's almost like our best kept secret, uh, but it's now starting to get out there that we now have a shift left story. And I know Jur uh, and the guys there, they've, they've released a ton of new updates, uh, this release into to LoadRunner Developer. I think uh, we should have a podcast that or kind of highlights LoadRunner Developer and how it fits into the whole continuous performance uh, story, right? From beginning to end where it's you're constantly running performance in your, your continuous integration pipeline, but also you're, you're using LoadRunner in the larger context picture as well so i think that would be a that would be a good show and i think a lot of people are are wanting to do that with loader and starting to do that with loader and developer but but not as many as we'd like right so we want to we want to talk about that a little more so so this is great um i i want to have you back on the show soon to talk about mm -hmm. because this is the first release post uh, open text uh, mm -hmm. and the acquisition yeah. so i i really want to get into a conversation about what this really means for how open text and load runner, what, what does it mean for load runner that it's now mm -hmm. an open text product? And uh, we can yeah. talk about that on another show, but is there anything else that you want to mention uh, before we, yes, end the show? there is. Uh, and there's one thing that I'm sort of keeping it to the end because I'm, I'm really sort of happy with this announcement. Uh, so, uh, you know, we support gremlin uh, for our integration for chaos and resiliency. Uh, and, and that has got really good adoption. Uh, and we started out in professional and then LoadRunner Cloud consumed that as well. So those guys have Gremlin integration now as well. Uh, but in some of our conversations with customers, they were a little bit worried about letting a Gremlin agent into their infrastructure because they had to punch holes in and out because the way Gremlin works, you inject that agent in your infrastructure and then that runs the events and writes the data back out to a control plane, which is the Gremlin SaaS uh, control panel. Uh, and that's where all of the reports and things are, are done there. So we had to do an assessment to look at vendors who had the same capability, uh, but they had it in an on-premise or off-cloud as we now refer to it in open text. Uh, so we've done an assessment, of, I think, of five or six different vendors, and we have settled on a vendor called Steadybit. Now, Steadybit is uh, relatively new. They're, they're a young uh, company, but they're growing pretty rapidly, and they're starting to, to make big waves uh, in that industry. Uh, so coming this release, we have released an integration, uh, and it's very similar to Gremlin, uh, with the difference being that during your controller scenario, uh, you can add a disruption event, but you don't need to go out to a SaaS managed service. You can go out to a local resiliency platform that steady bit help you set up, but it runs in your own infrastructure and it means you have full control out of that. Maintains all of your security mandates and usually lots of people are happy that that's being controlled and maintained. Uh, so this is our first foray with steady bit. But the announcement that I wanted to make was now we're the first performance uh, engineering tool that has uh, chaos or resiliency, not just on a SaaS service, but also on a local off-cloud or on-premise platform. Uh, and, and, and this is fantastic. And Steadybit have been a great uh, partner so far. We have good plans throughout the rest of this year to do joint go-to-markets and different events and things like that. Uh, so we're releasing it as tech preview with the idea being that by summer, that'll be a full general availability release. Uh, 
And we're hoping that lots of our load runner customers who had those preservations and, and security concerns about going out and using SaaS, that they'll be happy to, to take this service and start using it because we know that uh, you test more than the AUT these days. You test everything upstream and downstream and not just your application. Uh, so yeah, really happy with this, uh, with the work the guys have did to, to get this. That ready. sounds fabulous. Sounds great. Um, I can, I will make sure that we find the readme file and that we link to that online because of all these updates that we've seen. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, David, for being on the show. Um, we just one last question about uh, mm -hmm. the licensing of LoadRunner Community Edition. Has any of that changed? If somebody wants to get LoadRunner today, they just go to the LoadRunner page. They can still download LoadRunner and start using it for free with the 50 virtual users for the protocols and all that stuff. That's still the same, right? Yeah. So, so the way all of our all of our tools are governed by our uh, ALA, uh, and we have a section in there. In fact, we we updated some service descriptions there. Uh, and the community edition, whilst it is a sort of fully fledged edition of Loadrunner Professional, with a community license, which gets you all the protocols for fifty users, minus a couple of things like GUI, COM, and DCOM and templates. Uh, the idea is that it's used for proof of concept, so it's not publicly to be used for performance testing in production, but it's to get customers ready in a proof of concept situation where they look at that and say, I wonder if Loadrunner will be able to support this application or can I record this technology? Uh, but it is government governed by the ALA and we have a new ALA published for the release of 2023. Uh, but uh, but we want to make sure that we're compliant, but more importantly, our customers are compliant. So we do say that it's for proof of concept only and it's not to be used in a production environment. And the idea is that if you're happy with Loadrunner and it does everything it says on the tin for you, then you go and you get a, a commercial license and with that you get our support and maintenance uh, and all of our further patches and updates and, and R&D support and so on. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much again for being on the show and uh, we'll talk again very soon. Anytime. Thanks, Scott. Okay, so we're going to have David on the show uh, in probably a couple more weeks to talk about what does it mean that now OpenText owns the MicroFocus portfolio, the entire ADM testing portfolio, and we're talking, you know, Quality Center, uh, Load Runner, and all the other products that are out there. Of course, I'm most interested in Load Runner. Want to find out what is it? What does an OpenText Load Runner product actually mean? So don't don't miss that episode. Uh, I hope that you like what you're seeing on this program. If you do like it, it would be great if you clicked the like button on this video and also subscribed to our YouTube channel. You can go to that URL or scan that QR code and just let us know that you like this content and that we're doing something right so that we can continue to make these kinds of videos. You can also reach me uh, through various means. I'm on most of the social media Pro, uh, I have a profile on any of them, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. I'm on Facebook as well, if you can find me. But there's actually a QR code there you can scan. It'll take you to my bio, and it'll show you all the links of how you can get in touch with me for the SMC Journal, as well as my show, uh, The Performance Tour. So if you want to reach me by standard email, it's heyscott at smcjournal.com. would love to hear your feedback of what you think about the show and what else you'd like to see on the show this year. For this episode of the SMC Journal Podcast, this is Scott Moore saying thanks for watching and bye-bye.